Rachel. that um, I could play or sing that, that I, I used to do with Brett, but I can't play them because he played them. Um, let's see, what am I going to do? Okay, so... Of, of musical education in my life. My, my first stage of musical education was my parents. I come from a musical family. They're both music teachers and musicians that I played in the family band growing up. And subsequently, I created my own musical family and, and I'm married to an incredible bass player. And, and he was my third phase of musical education. I learned a lot of stuff from him. Like how to be humble. From my middle stage of musical education, from the time I was 12 years old until it hasn't really ended yet, um, is Brett. Um, Brett was kind of notorious for um, for igniting a spark in um, burgeoning musicians and, um, and and young people who are into music and. Um, And um, when I was 12 years old, um, he, I, I'm from Cadillac, Michigan, that's my hometown. And when I was 12 years old, um, Brett hosted the open mic in my hometown in this little bar that's in a resort in northern Michigan. It's called Curly's Up North Bar and Grill. And every Thursday, he would host an open mic in Curly's Up North Bar and Grill. And uh, my parents would go to see him play. And my dad, my parents were great music lovers, and my dad, who's one of the most enthusiastic music lovers on the planet, if you'd agree with me if you ever met him, he um, loves music so much that he sweats profusely when he, um, when he listens to music. Um, and he would like, um, come back <laughs> from seeing Brett play, and he'd be like, you gotta see this guy. You gotta see him play, it's amazing! And, um, and so my parents would take me to the bar on a school night when I was 12 um, <laughs> to go and listen to Rhett play, you know, play and sing. And, um, um, you know, before my parents took me to the bar, um, my, you know, my mom would go up to Brett and be like, Our daughter sings! Um, She's 12! Um, <laughs> listen to Brett play and maybe to get up and sing a song or two and I have no idea what he was thinking you know like my mom she's a very vivacious woman um and you know and she's like oh daughter is gonna come and sing with you um and so um I when I went there you know I was still kind of shy believe it or not I used to be shy um and you know I was got like you know fanned up there come on go play um and uh and Brett asked me what songs I know. And I'm a little 12 year old kid, you know, the Spice Girls were popular or whatever, <laughs> Nirvana, that kind of stuff. And I asked him if he knew the song Angel from Montgomery by John Prine. And he kind of said, Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I know that one. And I said, I love that song. Can we sing that one? And he said, Yes. And then after 
that, I asked him if he knew that song by Tim Buckley, um, Morning Glory. I love that song, too, and I told him I love the Ian Matthews version of that song. Um, my, my, um, and that's when his ears perked up. Yes, I know that one, too. Um, and then um, we played those two songs together, and it, um, I only ever before that performed with my parents, with my family. And um, I, my mom did all the talking and everything, and I just sang and stuff since I was little, so I was two. And, um, and any time I had to play solo, I was always really very nervous. And um, playing these two songs with Brett, this was the, the first time that I was comfortable playing and singing on stage without my parents next to me. And it was just this like, you know, it felt like a warm blanket around me. And um, that's what it was like every single time. And I would come back every week, and every week he would have a mixed CD for me with all of these um, singer-songwriters that I had never heard of, like Richard Thompson and Lucinda Williams and Sandy Denny. And he gifted me all of this music that became my biggest musical influence, that like when I was in that influential stage of, of finding a voice for myself and all of the music that I was listening to in that time, came from Brett. And um, when you play music with somebody, you have this, we play, we, we start, we, after that we played music together. I would go back every week and then I started writing songs but I didn't play any instruments and so I would sing him the song and he would come up with the music with what I was singing. And so all of the songs that we wrote together, I can't play them really because I can't play the parts that he wrote. I'm, I'm not that, I'm not, I'm not that great a player. Um, and, uh, and so I, I never get to do them other than with him. And um, we started playing together and touring together. We made records together. And we played and we toured together for about seven years in his little Volvo. And I think we put 500,000 miles on that thing. Um, and so um, what happens when, and, and I'm sure ev most everybody in here knows when you perform, when you play music with somebody, live music is something that happens in an instant, and it's a conversation, and it's um, it's not, even even a recording is different, if it's a live, even if it's a live recording, but it's something that's happening, and you have this exchange where you're exchanging bits of your heart and your soul, and you absorb the pieces from the other person's heart and soul. If you're in a band, it's a bunch of people, and you have this familial connection, and you become part of them, and they become part of you, and um, the biggest musical part of me other than my mom and dad, is Brett Hartenbach. And this is the, the first song we ever sang together.
<laughs> so the the other aspect of um, my of my life that Jack had a colossal influence on was my inappropriate sense of humor. <laughs> that every time a memory pops up about Brett, it's something hilarious and inappropriate. Um, <laughs> we were playing like outside of Chicago or something once and we were going on the Skyway and we went through a toll booth and the toll ticket guy, the toll taker was like the sourest dude in the whole wide world and he was just, he hated his job and he hated the world. And you could tell with the exchange, you know, it, just, it was a short exchange of change and stuff and, and Brett was driving. You know, and he was trying to talk to the guy, and he's always trying to, like, make a connection with people, right? And so he's, like, looking at him, he's like, hi, it's all over there, and the guy's like, oh, oh, oh. and he just wasn't, wasn't biting. And so Brett, we're pulling away, and Brett would not accept defeat, and so as we're pulling away, he just goes, have a nice day, and then slowly he goes, I love you. <laughs> when I get a sour toll taker, I'll tell them I love them. <laughs> Lil Bridge. <laughs> Those dudes <laughs> loved you. They were so mean. <laughs> we were, I was playing a festival outside of Brett's hometown in March, and um, and we were hanging out the next day, Aaron and I, and we had to cross that teeny tiny little yeah, bridge that's made out of paper yeah. and, um, and the toll guy, and I just... Crusty. He, 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 his super nickname crusty. is Krusty, I guess. No, they're all crusty. They're all super crusty. And, but I was just like, hi, hey, Aaron, blah, blah, blah. And the guy looked right at me, and he was like, you have a nice day. And Aaron was I like, lost I've it. never heard the sound of that man's voice. <laughs> <laughs> and one year for Brett's birthday, I gave him a haiku. Um, and I wrote it on a teeny tiny piece of paper. <coughs> And it was just, it was just the word balls 17 times. <laughs> Five times on the first line, seven times on the second line. You know, I, I don't know how you keep Balls, balls. And there was punctuation too, you know, to, to connotate inflection. Um, balls, ball, balls, period. Balls, comma, balls, balls, period. Balls, exclamation point. <laughs> and then there, it was like that for the other two lines. <laughs> and he carried that in his wallet. Uh, <laughs> everywhere he went, and then I found this message after he passed, right after he passed away, I found this message that he sent me that said that he, he had his wallet, he lost his wallet uh, a year earlier, he says, long story short, somebody found my wallet, I got it back a year later, and it still had the haiku in it. <laughs> That's very once in a while I would just like send him that haiku bald. <laughs> Now I'm telling Luke the ball haiku story at his life celebration. <laughs> Inappropriate humor. Not my fault, you guys. It's his fault. Mabachi was the worst misspelling of his name that was ever on a marquee. Like he went to play a show and it was on this big, nice theater marquee and it said Brent Mabachi. <laughs> <laughs> oh. So we called him Mabachi a lot. Um, that might have to be the title of my next record. Um, and a monkey boy was also another one of his nicknames that he had in Cadillac. And when I, this was when I was like 12 and 13, and somebody said, I, I, I remember asking when I was like 13 why his nickname is Monkey Boy. And one of the adults that was totally messing with me was like, because he has a tattoo of a monkey somewhere in his body that if you ever see it, you should call the police. <laughs> <laughs> Total lie. <laughs> But um, we just had, you know, House had Johnny Smokehouse Baloney, he had Michael Koo had a nickname, and Boss was the boss. I don't remember, honestly, like, I just remember one time just only calling him the boss, and I could never just call him Brett to his face ever again after a certain time. And so it's just, what, just one of those, just came out of the sky. 
I might, did I? Maybe I did, I have no idea. Just boss, just boss. Hey boss! Okay, so this is a very inappropriate irreverent song for this situation. Mm-hmm. <laughs>